Session, we'll explore ways to extend color into and through the fall season by planting and replanting. Plus, we'll get a jump start on next year's garden. And we'll look for ways to prepare your plants for winter, whether it's installing a cool season garden or protecting your plants from harsh weather. And we'll cover a few pointers on pruning. Soon you'll discover fall's a great time for planting trees, shrubs, and perennials. Why? The soil's warm and the air's cool. Great for the plants and the gardener. It's also a good time to record what went well and what you plan to change in the future. So let's get started by replanting a bit of our vegetable garden. Our teepee trellis was covered this spring with edible potted peas. Once they faded, we filled the trellis with beans harvested just in time to give way to these huge Brussels sprouts. Now, I'm probably one of the few people that loves Brussels sprouts, and maybe you do too, but I thought you'd enjoy seeing how they grow. It's kind of an unusual plant. The sprouts develop all along the stem, maturing from the bottom up. Now, you notice we had a lot of damage on the leaves from cabbage worms, and I think that's what happened to the lower leaves, because we like to leave the leaves on the plant as long as possible. The more leaves, the more energy produced, the better your harvest. So, we've got a few that are just ready for picking here, and they snap off very easily. And the wonderful Brussels sprouts can be steamed or grilled and buttered, and they take a light frost. So if you plant a little later or an early frost steps in, it'll just improve the flavor. In front of them, we have a variety of peppers, both bell and hot peppers. Now peppers start out green, and as they mature, they turn a nice red. Now with sweet bell peppers, the flavor intensity improves and it gets sweeter as it reddens. So wait till they're fully formed, starting to red, you'll have a sweeter crop. Many varieties are being introduced that turn red sooner. For hot peppers, they start out green, turn red or yellow or orange, and the flavor improves. So we've still got a little bit of harvesting to do here to enjoy, but let's step over and see what's happening in the next bed. As you can see, our tomatoes did great. In fact, the homeowner had so many she was able to do a bit of canning. Now a closer look at the plant may reveal a little bit of a disease problem called septoria leaf spot. And one of the things you may notice are these spots on the leaves. A common disease on tomatoes usually starts from the bottom and works its way up. The plant is fine, but by the end of the season, you'll have the ugliest looking tomato. One way to reduce problems with this is rotating your crops. So next spring, we'll plant our tomatoes in the other bed to help reduce problems with the septoria leaf spot. We'll clean that up in a bit. The other problem I often get ask about is cracked tomatoes. One of the problems with cracked fruit is the moisture imbalance. Too much or not enough water when the plants are starting to form the fruit versus when they're ripening. As that tomato expands, the skin doesn't and it cracks. You can still eat it, but you just want to cut out the bad area. Now you notice we have lots of green tomatoes left on the plant. Not a problem. If they're starting to show color like this, bring it inside, it'll finish to ripen. Even if it's just starting to go from dark to light green, that's a great way to know that it will continue to ripen indoors. The others, use them as fried green tomatoes or make some cha-cha sauce. Don't let them go to waste. It's a great way to add a little homegrown flavor to your meals as well. In front, we have some herbs, and you can see our basil did really well this year. And so we're gonna preserve a little bit. Our homeowner loves to cook and she used the fresh herbs, but the season's winding down and this way she'll have some fresh from the garden dried preserved basil. This is a great variegated pesto basil. We're just gonna clip these off, a few stems. Oh, and it smells so good when you're harvesting. And then I just pull a few of the leaves, they'll compost nicely. And then what I like to do is gather a few stems together, take a rubber band and tie them together. The reason I like a rubber band is as the stems shrink, so does the rubber band. So you don't lose your stems falling out of whatever you're using to contain them. So we're gonna wrap this up a few times. And then I like to use a spring-loaded clothespin to hang it from say a hanger 
Um, I've hung mine in my shutters. Any place that's warm, dark, and dry, you can use to hang your herbs. And they'll dry, harvest the leaves, store them in an airtight jar, and you'll have great success using them throughout the winter. Since we're in the backyard, let's take a look at the lawn and give you some tips on keeping it looking its best with minimal care. Whether you started with seed or sod, proper maintenance is key to keeping your lawn healthy and looking its best. As you can see, our homeowner is mowing high. Taller grass forms deeper roots. The tall grass is better able to outcompete the weeds, and the deep roots helps it be healthier, better able to tolerate drought, insects, and disease problems. She's also taking very little off with each mowing, removing no more than one-third of the total height, less stressful on the lawn, plus those short clippings break down quickly, adding organic matter, nutrients, and moisture right back into the lawn. It's equal to one fertilization a year if you leave your clippings on throughout the growing season. Fertilization is the next important step in keeping your lawn healthy. Those in the north are gonna fertilize Memorial Day, Labor Day, and sometime between Halloween and Thanksgiving, but definitely before the ground freezes. For those growing southern grasses like Bermuda and centipede grass, you're gonna fertilize Memorial Day, Labor Day, and no later than six weeks before the first frost. And don't forget about an early spring fertilization around Easter. Proper fertilization is important to encourage good growth. Fall fertilization provides the biggest benefit. It helps the lawns recover from the heat and drought of summer. Plus, at that time of year, the roots are growing, the plants are spreading, filling in those bare spots. So we feed the plants so that they're better able to outcompete the weeds and prepare for winter. If you are gonna fertilize, use a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. Here's the benefit. You'll feed the lawn over a long period of time. Low nitrogen, slow release fertilizers won't burn your lawn even during the heat and drought of summer. Plus, any fertilizer left in the lawn in the fall will be frozen in the ground and available next spring or sitting there waiting for your plants to grow when the growing season improves. Now, one of the things you'll wanna do is always sweep those clippings and fertilizer off any hard surfaces, walks, patios, because if they wash off, they'll go into the waterway. So we wanna be environmentally sound. And speaking of water, watering is the third important ingredient in growing a lawn. Now on a big lawn like this, or in areas where there might be watering bands, you may choose to skip watering, and that's fine. Most lawns will recover. If you do water, water thoroughly and less frequently to encourage good deep roots. If you let your lawn go dormant, leave it dormant. Bringing it in and out of dormancy is really what stresses the lawns and those are most likely to die. You will have a few more weeds, but you'll save a lot of water and your lawns will eventually recover. Now it's fall. When we're done fertilizing, it's a great time to plant perennials, trees, and shrubs. So let's get busy planting a tree and talking a bit about planting shrubs. The warm soil and the cool air make it a great time for trees, shrubs, and perennials to get established before winter sets in. It's also much easier on you, the gardener, as well. We've picked this beautiful crab apple to add some seasonal interest in this location. Whether you're planting a tree from ball and burlap, container like we have here, or bare root, or shrubs, there's a couple key principles that are always the same. One, with trees, we want to make sure the root flare, we'll look at that later, is at or slightly above the soil level. And we want to make a perfect hole. The old saying is you put a $10 tree in a $100 hole, you'll get much better results. For shrubs, we want the point between the crown, the above ground growth, and the roots to be at or slightly above the soil line. Those roots covered, but all the above ground growth above the soil. You can see we set out a few pyracantha to help hide that propane tank. We're testing it out to see if it looks right, also to make sure we have good access. The last thing you want is to have to maneuver around the shrubs or damage them when you're accessing that propane tank. We're gonna start by planting our tree. Besides being a four season interest crab apple, we picked one that was disease resistant so you don't lose the leaves midsummer from apple scab or the whole plant from fire blight. We'll have beautiful flowers in the spring, nice leaves all summer, good fruit fall through winter, and the birds will eventually clean them off. We also picked one with persistent fruit, so you're not raking and cleaning up as well. 
We checked the tags, which gave us information about the plant. We looked for good form, nice straight central leader, branches wide from the trunk, so they're good and strong and sturdy. We're not gonna do much pruning now, but we will eventually take off those tags. We're gonna get started planting this, but we also picked a smaller tree. Smaller trees catch up to the bigger trees, easier to get established, they'll grow much faster, and we'll get started. We're gonna take a look at the root flare and some of the things you need to do when putting it into the ground and planting. As you've noticed, we've made the hole much wider than the root ball and rather shallow. We're gonna measure from the root flare, the point where the roots go away from the trunk to the bottom, and that should be your depth. Don't dig any deeper because the plant will settle and then your tree will be planted too deep. Now, one of the things you'll find is you can carefully slide the tree out of the pot, but what we decided to do was cut off the bottom, set it in place, and find the root flare because we noticed it was planted a little deep in the container, a common problem you find with container as well as bald and burlap trees. So we're gonna carefully pull the soil back. Now the roots up above are adventitious roots, and that means those roots have formed because they were buried, the stem was buried under the ground. We don't want those to develop because they tend to girdle and eventually can strangle the tree. So we're gonna clip those off. We have a couple big ones, and then that's always a point where you have to decide, do we leave that up or do we take it off? That one's kind of big, so we're gonna see what we find. Again, pulling some of these roots. The other benefit of cutting away the pot is we disturb the root ball minimally so that the fact we've removed some won't hurt the tree as much. So let's dig down here. This soil import is the graft, that graft. What happens with ornamental trees is they take the desirable plant, like a prairie fire, graft it onto a hardier rootstock, just any crab apple, so it's a lot quicker and easier for the nursery, more affordable for you but that leaves this big knob. You wanna make sure that's above ground. Crab apples are also known as suckering plants, so you'll get some suckers forming at the ground. Just prune those off as they develop. I have one in my front yard, so if you have one, you know what I mean. So we'll pull that down. As I mentioned, we cut off the pot, slice the back so we could easily take it off. Now we're gonna look for any girdling roots and loosen those up. You can cut them off or use a cultivator. I've got a cobra head here. It works quite nice. A lot of times gardeners are a little nervous to do this, but the trees will benefit. If we don't remove those roots, they'll keep growing in a circle and eventually girdle the tree. Now we're gonna double check our depth as we pull back the soil. And we use the shovel trick where you lay the shovel across the hole, measure to make sure that it's the right depth. We've got one tall root over here. One of the ways you can manage that is put it on the hillside, twisting it forward. But we face the tree this way because the best side is facing the road where the homeowners will enjoy it as they pull into the driveway every night. So we're gonna loosen it. And you can start to see where those roots pull away, that root graft is coming out. Do a little more trimming. Now you may have noticed that I was roughening up the sides of the hole. That's very important, especially if you have heavy clay soil. Research has shown by making a wide hole and roughening the sides, the roots are better able to penetrate. Our homeowners are going to come back, fill in the hole using the existing soil. If we highly amend the soil, add peat moss and things, we create an in-ground container. And what happens then? The roots hit the heavy clay soil or the dry gravelly rocky soil and they turn and they keep growing in a circle. Again, girdling root. We want those roots to explore because tree roots eventually grow two to five times the height of the tree away from the trunk. So I'm gonna finish up here trimming it and then our homeowners are gonna come plant it, backfill with the existing soil, water to remove any air pockets and most importantly mulch. Great job. 
You may have noticed our homeowners did a few things differently than maybe you've done in the past when planting a tree. Notice they didn't fertilize. Research has shown that fertilization should wait until one year after. Your tree will get the best benefit. Give it time to start rooting in. Also, they didn't do a lot of pruning. We've also found the more top growth, the more energy produced, and the faster your tree will start to get established. But we do want to prune off any broken, crossing, or damaged branches. And that often happens during planting. We didn't stake the tree because we had a good root system in place, a good root ball. You only need to stake if you have a top-heavy tree, planting bare root, or your tree's in a very windy location subject to blowing over. I mentioned removing the tags. You want to do that because you'll be amazed how quickly your tree will grow and these can girdle. And your tags, you may want to keep the one with planting information. It'll tell you the size, the width, so that you know how big your tree is going to get. Check these before you buy, but keep them for your personal records. We're going to water. We water just to get rid of the air pockets mulched. Notice they pulled the mulch away from the trunk. No volcano mounds around the trunk of the tree. That encourages adventitious roots that eventually girdle and can kill your tree. We're going to put a soaker hose here so we can thoroughly water whenever the top four to six inches of soil is crumbly but slightly moist. It takes several years for a tree and shrubs to get established. Water and mulch are the best things you can do. Now let's take a look at our poolside garden and get it ready for fall. We designed the poolside garden for a busy couple, so we made it as low maintenance as possible. But plants are living things and they do require a little bit of care. We spaced our plants out so that they wouldn't need dividing soon and we filled in with some fennel. The fennel got pretty big, but we took some cuttings, harvested what we needed for cooking, and then used the rest in our dried arrangement. Great way to bring the landscape right to your back door. Now we've cleared out some space and we want to decorate a bit for fall. We're going to include some ornamental kale, pumpkins and squash right in the garden. It's a great strategy. If something dies, or as in the case of our annual fennel, we'll just pop that pumpkin or squash right on top. No one will know the difference pansies of course and mums. I'm going to take a few minutes and set this up, pop a few things in the ground including some bulbs so that we'll have some spring interest, make every activity twice as beneficial. So give me a few minutes and I'll get busy putting this together. In this large space we need to use big bold design features. That's why we have the big grasses, the shrubs, and we've added these ornamental squash and pumpkins just to give a lot of punch. Our Swiss chards looked good all season long. We've been harvesting when it's eight to 10 inches tall, so it keeps producing. We've allowed the cone flower, Echinacea, to flower, but also set seed heads as well, because we're gonna let the birds come in and feed on those and enjoy some of the winter interest. We included mums. Now, fall planting of mums, especially for northern gardeners, can be a bit tricky. It's a great addition to the garden when we sunk these in where we had vacant spots. In cold climates, they may not make it through the winter. If they do, you're an exceptional gardener. If they don't, you plan to use them as an annual. Increase your success of winter survival by planting in the spring. They'll grow all summer, put down roots, and flower, because right now, all the energy is going above ground. Mild climate gardeners will have pretty good luck keeping these over winter, even when they're fall planted. We've added ornamental kale. Now it is edible, but not real tasty. So you may want to stick to the kind that's used in the vegetable garden. We're also going to add bulbs in this garden. Big, bold, beautiful bulbs. Desert candle, nice and tall with a bold spike of flowers. Large scale daffodils and tulips, along with smaller minor bulbs towards the front. I want to thank Brent and Becky Heath with Brent and Becky's Bulbs, who provided all the bulbs for us. And they have lots of unusual bulbs you may want to try in your garden. Now, some of us are planting, putting our hardy bulbs, those that need a winter chill, in the garden in the fall or winter. And some of us may be taking those non-hardy bulbs, like cannas, dahlias, calla lilies, caladiums, out and storing them indoors for winter. Well, I've got another fun way you can use bulbs in your yard, large or small. We decided to brighten up the corner of this poolside garden with a few bulbs. We're mixing them into the lawn area, something you might want to try. You want early blooming bulbs, something like squills, early grape hyacinths, or crocus, so that they bloom and they're done by the time you need to start cutting your grass. 
but make sure you really want them in the garden because anything that kills the bulb will also kill your grass. So it's kind of a permanent solution for you. We decided to use crocus. And if you've grown crocus, you know that the squirrels also love them. These are crocus thomasinianus and they are listed as squirrel resistant. Now I'm a little skeptical, but I gave them a try and guess what, six years later, all my other crocus were dug up by the squirrels, but not these. So these are perfect for a lawn setting. So you don't plant and let the squirrels dig behind. Now moisten the soil first so it's easier to dig. And we've got quite a few rocks in this area, but I'm gonna use a garden knife because it's a great way to make small holes and get down about two to three inches deep. That's all we need to go for these small bulbs and pop them in place. So let me get started here. Now the bulbs, you want the the growing point up and the roots down, but guess what? If you plant them upside down, the bulbs will find their way to the surface. We're just gonna scatter them throughout the bed, cover them up the best we can. This is a good activity for the whole family, so you get a little help. And just basically a very informal design in this area because we want it to look natural. So we're gonna keep planting here. I'll finish these up just a bit later, but I wanna take a look at what we've been doing in our small space garden. So we'll check out fall interest in that landscape makeover. You may be familiar with daffodils and tulips, but there are some less common, more unusual bulbs you may wanna include in your garden. Scaly bulbs like this fritillaria or uh, lilies like your Easter lily, Oriental or Asiatic lily really are very interesting, much like garlic where you can peel the scales off. These need good drainage and good bright light. Plant them on the side if you have heavy soil so the water runs off the scales instead of collecting in them, causing rot. One whiff of a fritillaria you'll never forget. Kind of skunky and the animals tend to leave it alone. Aramaris or desert candle is a tuberous root. Looks kind of like a spider. These tuberous roots store all the energy in the growing points right at the tip. We're gonna plant this about an inch below the soil surface. The desert candle gets about four feet tall, so we're gonna put it in the back sunny corner near our deck so we can enjoy it next spring. Colchicum, sometimes called autumn crocus, is a wonderful fall blooming plant. It's kind of a leap of faith. You buy it already growing in the fall, get it in the ground, it will bloom then die back. Next spring, it sends up leaves that put energy back in the bulb. The leaves die back and disappear. And then you get flowers the following fall, no leaves. Great for mixing in with ground hovers, perennials, and annuals. A wonderful fun bulb, you ought to give a try. And the animals tend to leave it alone. We're gonna mix up bulbs too. So you may take common bulbs, in this case, daffodils and grape hyacinths. Both are good at naturalizing, they're wonderful. This has two noses, so you'll get one good bloom, and maybe a small bloom or definitely bloom next year. The muscari is much smaller. This is Armenian grape hyacinth, nice and robust. Now, this is a tall daffodil, and it'll be skirted by the lower grape hyacinths. In the front, we're putting baby boomer daffodils lower, so it'll be about on the same level as the grape hyacinth, doubling our bloom impact in this one bed. Now, we're gonna plant the bulbs three times their vertical height deep, and we're gonna mix in the muscari, kind of in an informal manner, because we're naturalizing the plantings here. A garden knife or a trowel works great. Many of them even have the measurements to help you with guiding how deep to plant the hole. Make sure you get it good and deep because you need to have it insulated from the cold and the heat the cold in the winter and the heat of the summer, we're gonna cover it and tamp it down. Now you can either fertilize in the planting hole or what I like to do is on top once I get all these bulbs in the ground. Notice I used a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. I wanna give it a little nutrient this fall, but not too much to stimulate growth. No bone meal, please, because the rodents love that bone meal. They'll go after it and your bulbs. So later I'll come back, scatter these muscari in between the daffodils, sometimes called narcissus, their botanical name, and we'll include those in this bed. You may notice that we did deadhead the cone flowers. The owner was hoping for a second flush of bloom. Didn't quite have enough time or the right growing conditions, but she did throw the seed heads in the garden because they will reseed. 
Now you can leave them stand for winter on the plant to attract birds and for winter interest, or if you have too many plants, deadhead them and get them out of the garden. This is also a great time to plant pansies, and these are the cool wave pansies, a new spreading pansy. So instead of spacing them six inches apart, you can space them about 12 inches apart, and they're cold hardy in zones five to four. So plant them in the fall when you're planting your bulbs. They'll give you flowers through December until the snow falls, and as the snow clears, they'll perk up, give you bloom. The nice part, as you leave the leaves of your fading bulbs, or as the leaves are emerging in spring, these flowers will help cover it up, adding color right at ground level. So be sure to include a few of these cool wave pansies in your garden. Now you may notice that we did have mulch, lots of leaves. I didn't rake this out of the garden because it's a great natural mulch. A good way to be sustainable. Leave your leaves, the small ones like this, in your gardens for mulch around your plants. Shred the bigger ones with your mower and leave them on the lawn. As long as you can see the grass for the leaf pieces, you're fine. Shred them, dig them into your annual flower beds. They'll break down over winter and you'll have great soil, or at least a little bit better, come spring. So look for ways you can include leaves in your landscape practices. Less work for you. Speaking of mulch, we'll talk about a little different kind of mulch, vertical mulching. The perennial garden in the neighbor's yard is doing okay. It's struggling a bit. Not enough to replace all the plants, but they certainly need a boost. We top dress with compost. Doing that every other year will definitely help your perennials healthy or struggling. But we want to speed things up, so we're going to vertical mulch. Basically take an auger used for planting bulbs under trees, attach it to a cordless drill, and work that compost in. The benefit is we get the compost down to the root zone and we aerate the soil. Do it in several places and you'll get that aeration and it'll really help improve your plants. The other thing after you prepare the soil, it's a great time to plant bulbs. We've got some Dutch iris and you may think of iris as rhizomes, but these are actually bulbs. Good in zone six to eight or nine and they'll be early bloomers great for cutting. We're also gonna include some crocus. These are corms, and sometimes it's hard to tell which side up. This side goes up, the root plate goes down. They'll be planted very shallow, and this will give us nice spring growth. Now, if you've grown crocus, you know, the squirrels and the rabbits love them. So you do need to use some animal repellent. I like the natural products like Messina Animal Stopper. It's made of herbs, and so it's natural. It won't hurt pets or kids, but it does keep the animals away. So you may want to use some type of repellent at planting, and especially when the plants come up in spring so those deer and rabbit don't eat all your crocus. It's also a good time to put in perennials in the fall. Not only big plants like the coral bells, that the neighbors have, but also small plugs like this. We can pop these in as we're planting our bulbs. And this lamium, dead nettle, you can see we're working that compost right in. That dead nettle will fill in around the hostas. Very shade tolerant, beautiful flowers in the spring, and it will look really nice with bulbs popping through and the hostas surrounding it, as well as the coral bells. We decided to add a few coral bells to tie it into the neighbor's yard, that area we just got done planting last spring, to really carry that through the neighborhood. And of course, some fragrant stalks for a good fragrant finish to the season. Now that we've done this, let's pop some bulbs in between the existing coral bell planting that's a bit fuller and requires a little bit different planning and care. The coral bells we planted this spring are really doing quite well, even in this shady condition. Now most bulbs like full sun, but some will tolerate shade, and we're going to add bulbs to this front entrance to really liven it up in the spring. Next to the benches, we're going to use some crustata, iris crustata, which is a crested iris, shade tolerant, the leaves look good most of the season, and you'll have beautiful blooms early in the season. You notice it's a rhizome, not a bulb like we saw earlier. Squills are beautiful blue bulbs, come up early, shade tolerant, and will fill this garden eventually. We're starting with a small amount, but they'll multiply quickly and really add a beautiful blanket of blue to the garden. 
Next to the benches, we're going to include snowdrops, some of the first minor bulbs, smaller scale bulbs, to sprout in the spring. Again, shade tolerant, early bloomer. And one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at sun and shade conditions is much of our shade is the result of tree canopy, all those leaves. Early in the spring, the trees haven't leafed out, so the shade isn't there until later, after the bulbs have put on their show and much of the foliage has declined. We're mixing a variety of bulbs in here, not only to add color but mixing them with perennials is a great way to reduce your maintenance. The bulbs will peak up through the foliage, bloom, and then as they fade the new leaves on the coral bells will fill in masking those declining bulb leaves. We must leave the leaves as they decline in spring to put energy back in the bulb and hiding them with perennials reduces your maintenance and improves the look and beauty of your garden. We're gonna also use a variety of colors. We've picked a lot of apricots to go with our purples, ambers, and chartreuse. Now often you think of planting daffodils in groups alone, or maybe hyacinths by themselves, or tulips. But well, we've selected a variety that have a lot of apricot colors in common. So our gypsy hyacinth is a beautiful apricot fragrant bloom mid-spring. We've used an apricot beauty tulip that's going to give us a lot of beautiful color that will complement that gypsy um, hyacinth. And then of course a daffodil salome which has an apricot trumpet and a white backdrop. So these three will go together. Mixing it up gives us a variety of textures in the garden and it really expands our design and our bloom impact and if the animals eat your tulips you still have the hyacinths and the daffodils to put on a show. Well, I'm going to get busy planting these. You've noticed I've set them out to make it easier to do my design ahead of time. So I'll start planting, and then we'll take a look at the garden overall for one last look at this beautiful front entrance. The goal of our design for this front garden was to fill this small space with beauty from curb to the front door throughout the growing season, and I think we've done just that. We're back at our small space test garden, and as you can see, it's fall. We've tweaked some of our ideas, worked on our solutions, and added a bit of seasonal color. We're gonna look at our biggest challenge first, shade and a lack of water. And it's something you may be struggling with, trying to grow a garden under an awning or deck. Things are looking better, but the extremely low light and lack of moisture have us off to a slow start. The ferns, growing in that corner with the impatience are doing well. The impatience have stretched out reaching for the light, but provided lots of color throughout the season. The simisifuga we added is off to a slow start. With the lack of light and moisture, it's gonna take a while for it to really take off, so we need to be patient. So in the meantime, we added this indoor palm, tolerant of low light, provides the screening and softening we are looking at, and we can move it indoors for in the winter but we'll talk about that in just a bit. The ferns we used to kind of de-emphasize that meter so that we didn't notice it. It's doing okay, but that extremely low light really has it struggling. What you may want to do, and what we'll do next year, is swap it out with the other fern growing nearby that has a bit more white. By swapping them out, every week or two, we'll have two good looking ferns. Now let's take a look at the rest of the garden. We've moved to a bit sunnier corner of this garden room where we added some annuals to existing and new perennial plantings. As you can see, they're all doing quite well, including the Simisifuga, planted at the same time as the one in the dark corner, but with the right light and moisture doing much better. But not quite enough light for the Clematis, or as many of you may say, Clematis. The problem here is still not enough sunlight for it doing well. We gave it another season in this garden, but we'll be moving it to an even sunnier spot next spring. Now, taking a look at the plants, you'll notice the Hakanakloa grass, or Japanese forest grass, is doing okay, but off to a bit slower start. The old saying, the first year perennials sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap, certainly is true in this case. We'll give it a little more TLC and watch it take off next season. But in the front of the garden, the money wort certainly left in this first season, crawling off across the patio where it's doing quite well, giving the look that the homeowner wants. Now, if you like it a bit neater and tidier, just get out the pruners and keep it trimmed, and it'll do just fine. And you may have noticed we added a few containers to provide a little bit of a definition of space in this garden and add some seasonal interest. So let's move on to the next spot. 
As you can hear, we've turned the fountain on for a little extra ambiance in this corner, and the extra sunlight sure has made a difference in how this clematis is growing. We've left the seed pods on for winter interest because they'll persist through the winter, and we'll leave the plant stand so that the birds will have a nice habitat. Now pruning is a common question I receive on clematis, and you may be wondering as well. If your clematis blooms in the spring, prune it right after flowering, if it needs pruning. If it blooms in the summer or fall, prune it in late winter or early spring before growth begins. And prune only if you need to control the size or remove disease or insect infested stems. You'll notice the grass in front has really taken off. The Shenandoah switchgrass really provides a nice light airy texture among the Siberian iris but we'll remove a few of those Siberian iris this spring to give it more room to grow and flourish. We also added some asters by the fountain. You may remember we had beautiful blue lobelia for spring and early summer, but the heat of this summer really took them and other cool season annuals out. But the good news is it's an opportunity to try new plants. We added some nice fall interest with these potted asters. This is just one of many ways you can use containers in your small or large garden. Join me for my container course for even more ideas. Now we're going to take a look at this peony that's had a few problems this summer and give you some quick fix ideas. Our peony is suffering from a common disease, Botrytis and Phytophthora blight, causing all these spots. One of the easiest solutions is to remove the infected leaves as you find them, leaving a lot of the green foliage to photosynthesize and put energy back in the plant. Key to clean up is fall. Cut it right back to ground level and dispose of those infected leaves. Don't compost as you'll spread the disease. After clipping, we're gonna have a bit of a hole in our garden. So I potted up some stalks to fill in this hole. It'll add some nice fragrance as well as white, echoing the white of the vinca and the lantana to brighten up this corner so the homeowner can enjoy their garden in the evening. The fragrance just adds an extra sense to this garden, making it wonderfully fragrant, along with the lavender that's just beginning to bloom and the gardenia that flowered earlier in the season. You may notice that our geraniums are spilling over the edge. I love the way it looks and so does the homeowner, but you can trim these back throughout the season for a little neater and tidier appearance. Isn't the arbor amazing? In just one short season, our annual hyacinth bean vine has quickly covered this arbor. The flowers and seed pods add color and drama to this trellis. While our perennial vine, the sweet autumn clematis, is just getting started. We've got a few fragrant blossoms, but in a couple of years, this vine will quickly cover the arbor, providing fragrant flowers for the homeowner to enjoy each fall. Now, I might want to remind you that, you know what, this garden room had a few things in place, but not enough, and we had quite a few challenges, something you may be able to relate to. But in one short season, from April to September, we made quite a few changes, so now we have a beautiful retreat for our homeowner to enjoy year-round. As we close this series, I'd like to share my favorite definition of a green thumb gardener. It's someone who's planted a lot of plants, perhaps killed a few along the way, but most importantly, they keep planting. So keep this in mind as you move forward. Now we've covered a lot on this journey and I hope you found it to be wonderful. One of the things I like about gardening, it's never finished. You're always learning more and best of all, there's always new plants to try, filled with variety and the opportunities are endless. I love to watch the garden throughout the season. Seeds become plants, bulbs burst into bloom, the gardens transform. Changes, big or little, are powerful. I also love the sight, scent, smell, birds and butterflies that fill the garden. I hope these ideas will get you through the growing seasons and always keep the four R's in mind. The right plant, for the right purpose, in the right place to give you the right look. And that's any look that you desire. If you do this, you'll always create beautiful gardens. And consider keeping a photo journal to share with your friends, much like our homeowners did. And then take some time to relax and enjoy the beautiful garden that you created. But most importantly, have fun.